Well, welcome back to Mount Vernon. I think we're live now. Uh, are we live, Matt? Yeah, he's being very silent now, but we'll talk to Matt shortly, I'm sure. He'd be happy to know that we're both social distancing and doing all we need to do to follow the proper CDC guidelines. And I hope you are too, in your communities and in your families, taking care of each other. This is a really challenging time for everybody. And here at Mount Vernon, we are still thriving in our closure period. The blooms are beautiful outside, the animals are doing great, the lambs are still being born. Uh, and uh, we are trying as we can to get as much digital content out there for people who are at home to get out of their heads a little bit and also learn something about the extraordinary history of this country. Today, I'm gonna focus on, as I promised you, the first term of George Washington's presidency. Um, now, when we think about the presidency, we think about it in terms of terms, uh, presidential terms, his election cycles, uh, all that was unknown in George Washington's time. I mean, they had written the Constitution in Philadelphia, and they had had a national debate on this uh, incredible new form of government, argued about it, agreed to amend it, but basically put it into place in the form it was in. And of course, it describes the office of the presidency, but it was all just theoretical. It was all just in people's minds of what that would be and how it would actually function. And when George Washington is uh, elected as the first president of the United States, they don't even have protocols for having a national election of that kind at all. And of course, you'll remember that the Constitution has the electoral college system. So when states are electing presidents, they're not actually electing people, they're electing electors. So they're, they're choosing electors who themselves are going to choose the president. Now, uh, the framers of the Constitution put this in because they believed uh, that, that the country would therefore make better decisions about who the president would be, that it wouldn't be possible for somebody to be well known across all the states unless they were fairly prominent. Uh, and you wanted to make sure that the best people, essentially they were imagining uh, that either the state legislatures or the voters, because in some cases it was split, would be choosing these electors who then themselves would come together in a body, debate and choose a nominee for the president of the United States. And the person that got the most votes across all the different states would become the president. And the person that got the second most votes would be the vice president. Now in this first election uh, cycle in the United States, it was, very, uh, it was a very new thing. So the electors came together in every state and some were appointed directly by their state legislatures. Some were actually elected by a statewide election, uh, but they came together and they chose uh, candidates <clears throat> and George Washington ended up uh, being the anonymous choice. Uh, each elector would choose two candidates. And so you ended up getting, George Washington was one that everybody chose and then they all chose somebody else and these were relatively famous people in their regions. John Adams was one, uh, of course, who got the second most votes uh, and he became vice president. But compared to the unanimity which created the election of George Washington, the choosing of John Adams was way down the list. And this is something he would never forget. We'll talk about Adams perhaps uh, at a future time. But so George Washington is selected by the electors as president of the United States. He gets that news at Mount Vernon uh, you know, somewhere in the new room, probably, or maybe out on the piazza. Uh, and at that point, he has to choose whether to serve again uh, and to serve his country. And by that point, uh, he was ready to come back into service and help make sure that what he called this experiment in democracy would last. Now, uh, there's a lot of great questions about this early presidency because he really does create a lot of the... Um, uh, the precedents that we come to take for granted about how a president should operate uh, from little things to what you call the president to big things like who controls the foreign policy, uh, how does the president make decisions in an executive office which is intended to be mixed with the legislative but also separate, uh, all kinds of aspects like that that Washington really set a standard that very many other presidents would follow. And that in, in many ways we still think of today when we hear someone saying, well, that person isn't being very presidential. Somewhere deep down in their minds, they have a vision of what a president should be like. And George Washington helped set that standard of decorum uh, and decency that Americans have wanted to see in their head of state. It's a unique role, the presidency, because on the one hand, uh, he is 
the head of state. He's the one elected official that's intended to represent the whole nation under the Constitution. Obviously, our Congress people represent their districts. Our senators are intended to represent the states. At least that's the way it was originally thought of, uh, as the states are represented in the Senate and the Congress representing their districts. Only the president represents the whole nation as a person and has those functions similar to a monarchical, to a monarchical head of state, so embodying the idea of the nation in this one person. At the same time, of course, the president is also a political actor. And we know today, of course, that presidents are head of parties. And so there's always that push and pull between, you know, uh, do we have to love the president? Do we have to love the office of the presidency? Do we have to support the president? Isn't that the nation then? Isn't it symbolically the nation's leader that we need to support? Or is it a partisan leader? Is it a party leader? Now, in George Washington's time, uh, there was no national parties yet. And that's an important story that you have to tell when you teach the history of George Washington's presidency, the rise of the first opposition party. And when I say that, I mean a really a national opposition party. And that's some of the themes uh, we'll get at today as well. So the presidency is a fascinating moment in Washington's life because on the one hand, he's a well-known leader by this time in the United States. He'd been the commander in chief of the American army for eight years of the American revolution. He'd been the president of the, uh, uh, of the constitutional convention. He was visible during the ratification debates, at least in print uh, and in people's minds. And now he's going to be uh, you know, playing this role officially as the father of the country, uh, as the first president of a new nation. And so uh, I'll get to a lot of these firsts, I think, as we, as we talk about it today. But one of the things I want to start with before we go to the question board, maybe, uh, is actually leap a little bit ahead into his first year in the presidency. And, and I can use this incredible book that we own here at Mount Vernon to help tell that story. Now, this is a book uh, that is uh, one of the most expensive books that was ever sold at auction in American history. In fact, when the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, which is Mount Vernon, uh, when we were building the presidential library for George Washington in 2012, uh, it's remarkable that it took that long for him to get his own presidential library. This book came up for auction and it sold for millions of dollars. Uh, now, the book I have in my hand is actually not that original book. This is a replica uh, of that book. Um, it's, the book is called The Acts of Congress. <clears throat> and I'm going to walk through why it was so expensive and why it matters. Right now, you need to know you can get your own copy of this for $34.95 online at mountvernon.org. Uh, don't, don't forget to, to shop for the person who has everything. It's really an extraordinary book, though. So why was it so valuable? Well, first off, it's a window into the mind of George Washington as he's becoming that first president of the United States. It is a book of, of laws. It's a copy of all the laws passed by the first Congress under the Constitution of the United States. So the Constitution is just a document and the government has to be created. And one of the first things it does is it arranges for the calling of the first Congress. The first Congress arrives in March, 1789, and the president is inaugurated for the first time in April of 1789. And it's an inauguration scene that's depicted behind me here in the museum with George Washington taking the oath of office in New York in what is Federal Hall, uh, which was redesigned actually by the people of New York to try to be an impressive building to represent this new government. Uh, and he's on this balcony surrounded by people and there's thousands of people in front of him all over the streets of Manhattan uh, cheering long live George Washington after he finishes his oath of office using a Bible uh, from a local Masonic lodge. Uh, before this scene happened here, it had been preceded by a triumphal march of George Washington from Mount Vernon to New York City. In fact, he was greeted with uh, songs. He was greeted with groups of young women dressed in white, uh, you know, who, who uh, as he passed over a bridge in Trenton, lowered a laurel wreath closer to his head. Triumphal arches had been built temporarily to celebrate his, uh, his, his march, essentially, to the presidency. Uh, so the whole event was celebrated across the country uh, with great uh, excitement. And in, in fact, uh, he, uh, when he arrived in Manhattan, he came across the water of, of, uh, into Manhattan Harbor on a barge that was rowed by 13 sailors, surrounded by all kinds of pleasure vessels and other vessels 
which were festooned with decorations. And as he writes in his own diary entry, you know, his diary entry of that moment is the greatest source because it describes not only his fear and anxiety, but also the, the extraordinary pomp and circumstance, which of course he's downplaying whether he merits it. Oh, oh, I can't believe this. Uh, but on the other hand, he clearly uh, is, is part of it and living in it. And so he talks about the musical accompaniment, both vocal and instrumental. So imagine barges surrounding Washington's barge playing music as he floats across the river uh, and enters New York uh, on the way to his inauguration, which you see behind me, uh, which again was a day of pomp and circumstance. So he's inaugurated in April of, of 1789, April 30th. Uh, and then that year, or that session of Congress, which lasts from March until September, passes the laws that are really going to create the government. So uh, they pass the first lighthouse bill. They, they create the executive departments. They create the judiciary. Um, this all has to be defined because the, the con Constitution just lays out the rules. The legislature, legislature has to define how these actual departments will work. Uh, and, of course, they pass... Uh, the first uh, uh, customs efforts to, to make sure this country can, can raise some revenue. Uh, it's a remarkable session, and it, it also has in it a series of um, uh, amendments to the Constitution, which we now know as the Bill of Rights. These were things that uh, the Federalists had promised, uh, promised that they would pass as a way to make everybody happy about the new Constitution. There were some concerns about it being too powerful, that the rights of the people weren't protected, that the rights of the states weren't set aside. You've heard a lot about the 10th Amendment in the news lately. The 10th Amendment says that anything in the Constitution that isn't enumerated belongs to the states or to the people as their, uh, as their power or their right. And so it's essential kind of concerns about making sure the federal balance is in place, that the rights of individuals are protected and that the government is restrained a little bit more. And so it's an incredible session. Can you imagine passing all those laws and all those amendments in one session? George Washington is signing off on all the laws and he is framing a letter for the amendments because he has to send them out to all of the different states for ratification as well. So he's deeply involved in this effort to stand up the government. The other person deeply involved is James Madison. We know he had been his great collaborator on the Constitution and the movement to approve the Constitution in Virginia. And Madison is really his go-to uh, guidepost on what he should be doing uh, in terms of decorum in the presidency, whether he should receive uh, certain people in a certain way, whether he should visit certain people. So that year uh, in that first year in office is a tremendously innovative one, a complicated one, and unique in American history. There's really no other year like it in American history when this fundamental office of the presidency and all the other uh, aspects of government are being laid out for the first time in a systematic manner. So the book contains all those efforts that were done by that Congress. And then they, it also is great because it's not just any book, it's the book that the Congress gave to George Washington. It was bound specially for him. In the binding, it says President of the United States. So we own his copy. It is a beautiful book. It's got this marbled pages. It got, it's got his book plate in it, which represents his ownership of it. You know, books are very valuable in the 18th century. Uh, gentlemen particularly wanted to make sure that their books were, were well identified. They had a tendency to walk away with people. And then, of course, uh, his great signature on the cover page, which says acts passed at a Congress of the United States. So laws passed at a Congress of the United States between March and September of 1789 held in New York City, the, the seat of government at the time. But, and all those things would make this a remarkably important artifact of Washington's first presidency. But I also like it to, to illustrate uh, his mindset in that moment in time because of what's, uh, what's in it. Uh, George Washington receives this book in, uh, sometime after September of 1789, uh, and then the Congress will come back for their second session in January of 1790. And before that Congress comes back, George Washington sits down and rereads the book, rereads all the acts they passed the last session and rereads the Constitution and also marks it up in the margins. And that's what's so extraordinary. And so if you go with me, our Article 1, as you know, lays out, enumerates the powers of the Congress and the legislative branch. And in those areas where the powers of the legislature are mixed 
with the presidency, the executive branch, uh, George Washington draws little brackets around those sections of the Constitution and writes in the margin, President. So, for instance, every bill shall pass the House of Representatives and the Senate goes to the president to be signed, and then he, or he can veto the bill, which it goes back. That's all laid out. So he identifies that as his role in the legislative process. The treaty-making power, uh, president, uh, president. So all these aspects where uh, you know senators have to uh, approve the appointment of different uh, members. The president's role is laid out, and he is identifying his place with these little marginal notes. Get to Article 2. It's all about the presidency. This is the real deal. Okay, we're getting to it here. The executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States. Boom. Simple. He puts right next to that president, identifying the whole article as his business. He gets down here. He shall have power. What is Washington right? President powers. And then down here where it says, he shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. He writes required. So it's an extraordinary insight into the mind of a man who at the time was really at the height of his leadership powers. He'd been a successful leader for many years, but here he is sitting down, reading the constitution again, binding himself to the rule of law, in this case, the fundamental law of the land, making sure that he knows what is required of him in this system and really thinking it through. He's, he's doing this the way that we read with a highlighter pen. Uh, you know, he's not writing a commentary on the Constitution in here. He's just highlighting you know, and focusing the mind. So you can see the mind of a man in focus here as he's preparing to do this job to really define this extraordinary role. And I think what's what's really cool about this moment is, is thinking about when he's doing it. My uh, argument and hypothesis is that he is doing this at the same time uh, that he's preparing for the first State of the Union address. In fact, that's in that section that he marks required. And the st first State of the Union address, uh, you know, is is welcoming the Congress back into session and laying out what the priority priorities are for the session. Now he's been working with James Madison on what this address should be. In fact, it, Madison writes most of the the address in consultation with Washington. And Washington that evening, June 9th, 1790, or sorry, January 9th, 1790, writes a letter to Catherine Macaulay Graham, who's this great English historian, in which he writes to her um, that the new constitution is the last great experiment in human happiness uh, under civil authority. He says it was to be a, con a, nobody can believe all the challenges we had to get through to get in this moment. Uh, it was to be a government of laws as well as accommodation. He writes, uh, much of, to create it, much of it took prudence, much took firmness, much co took conciliation. So he's laying out sort of reflectively, you know, himself in this moment. It's remarkable that they wrote this new constitution, that they got it ratified, and then all the work they had done to create the government, uh, that he's writing it with the extraordinary effort. I, I love that passage about it required firmness, conciliation, and prudence. All great leaders know that there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat. Uh, sometimes you have to be firm. Oftentimes you have to conciliate. You have to conciliate and, and allow for the fact that other people might be right or they might have the correct point of view and you have to be prudent. Some things you might not fight that battle that day. Uh, so he's really reflecting on the fact that this has been a real challenge of balancing the different interests and the, and the states and the individuals uh, and trying to figure out what's right and wrong in a challenging environment where they're trying to stand up a revolutionary form of government that's never been tried before. A last great experiment in human happiness. He, when he says last, he means latest, essentially. The latest effort for human beings to try to create a government using reason uh, in, a, in, a, in, in a conciliating fashion. So the last great experiment in human happiness under, under human uh, reason. Uh, and then he also goes on to talk about his own role as president. As he writes, I walk on untrodden ground. Everything I do is subject to two interpretations. Everything I do is making a precedent. So when he's writing in this book, uh, basically a year after he's inaugurated president, he, he's, he's looking at his role as one creating precedents for the ages. Washington is thinking not just about the news cycle, right? The immediate challenges of winning 
uh, power and arguments. He's thinking about 30 years, 40 years into the future. What will he leave behind as a leader in, in creating this institution in which everything is new? He walks on untrodden ground. There's no guide for him to follow. He can't ask, how did the last administration deal with this crisis? How did the last president uh, deal with, you know, the different concerns of each region? How did they surround themselves with representative people who could reflect the diversity of the country and its needs? Uh, how did they create policy in the Congress? I mean, are they the ones that are supposed to originate it or are they just there to be passive, listening to Congress and then signing or not signing on legislation. Uh, what is the role in the, of, of the president uh, in the fundamental character of this new American Union? And so it's a remarkable document, I think, when you understand that full context of Washington creating an office which is now, we know it as the most important strategic office of leadership in the world because of the power of the United States. And he, and he is the first. He is the one that defines so many aspects of how the presidency will function in the United States of America. So why don't I take a question as a way to pause on that moment. We can get into some of the, the details of what he did, what he didn't do, and the challenges of that first administration in office, which is really extraordinary. So Doug, Matt. Doug, we have some great questions, uh, many of them. Uh, Beth May said, uh, asked, did Washington enjoy being a president uh, and, and where he did he live during his first term? Great question, uh, Bethany, right? Uh, question, <clears throat> where did he enjoy being president? Where did he live? Uh, well, well, let's remember now the capital of the United States moved around. In fact, that's one of the big policy arguments of the, uh, uh, of the first Congress, uh, I'm sorry, the first, uh, the first term of the presidency. Um, right now it was in New York. So it, it had the inauguration and through 1790, it's in New York, then it moves to Philadelphia. Uh, George Washington is put in charge of creating the seat of government, which I'll talk about perhaps uh, in more detail, uh, which becomes Washington, D.C., but he never serves as president in Washington, D.C. In fact, he's the only president of the United States who doesn't serve in the city that's named after him uh, uh, in, in, um, in, the, in the office of the presidency. So he actually lives in two locations in New York, um, and eventually he lives in, in one location in Philadelphia, uh, both of you, you can find both these on the Washington map uh, that we have this great interactive map in our digital resources that shows you everywhere Washington slept uh, that could be identified, as well as places like that, special places where, you know, the first executive mansion of the United States in New York and the second and then another one in Philadelphia as well. Did he like being president? Uh, no, he hated being president. And I think that we we have to accept him at his word on this. Um, you know, he clearly thought that he had something to contribute. You know, he came out of retirement to help the country form a more perfect union, and he wanted to see that through and make sure it lasted. It's clear to me that he only wanted to be in there till it really got going. You know, let's set up the sails on the ship of state, let's get it out of the harbor, but let's then hand it off to somebody else to captain the ship, uh, to use a metaphor that's out there in the world these days. And, and so uh, Washington wanted off that ship as soon as he could get off it safely, as long as he knew that ship wasn't going to founder uh, on the shoals of partisanship or, or foreign influence. Um, I'm really beating this metaphor to death, but, uh, but it's useful because no one would let him leave the ship. He had to stay. Uh, and in fact, by the second term, he's really quite miserable. It, it, uh, it becomes very challenging personally for him. It becomes very difficult uh, uh, in a kind of public um, a persona. He's very sensitive about his own reputation. He always wants to do a good job and, and he feels like he can't do a good job anymore, at least up to his standards. And so he gets increasingly frustrated and alienated from public service uh, through the course of his two terms as president. So, uh, but more on that is, is an interesting uh, thing to talk about because I, I do have some thoughts on who he thought should be the person to follow him and that changed over time. Matt. So Matthew would like to know, what was a typical day like for Washington during this time? A typical day for Washington in, pres in the presidency, uh, it it's harder to, to identify typical than it is when he's here at Mount Vernon, because he did have a really a good routine or a pretty strict routine that we can follow very well. 
but he had kind of weekly routines, I think, which may be one way to look at it. Early on, in conversations with James Madison and others, Tobias Lear, his personal secretaries, um, he's trying to figure out, well, what does a president do uh, during the day? Right? Do, am I supposed to go visit people? Is it, is it uh, acceptable for me to visit individual, private individuals in their homes? Uh, you know, and then how do I not show favor to the different political members of the different branches of government? And so he developed a routine, really, that I would think of more as a weekly rather than a daily routine. But certain days of the week, on Tuesdays, he would have formal uh, levies. Uh, and levies kind of smacked of monarchy to some people because essentially he would be in a room and any gentleman of note could come to these things. Now, the 18th century is a very different world from ours. And what a gentleman is, is, is understood in society in a way that today we wouldn't be able to stop the flow of people. Um, these were folks who had some established reputation in the society or had been introduced into that society, formerly men of certain wealth uh, and rank. And they knew who they were, essentially. You know, if you didn't know whether or not you could go to the levy, then you probably shouldn't go. Uh, but essentially, that, that was a large part of the political community who were running things. And so they could formally come visit him on Tuesdays, and it lasted about an hour. And, and people would come in, and George Washington would be standing in front of the fireplace at the room in the president's mansion, and uh, a gentleman would approach him, and Washington would hold a hat in, in his hand, making it clear that he wasn't going to shake anybody's hand. And so they would bow uh, to him, uh, you know, acknowledge their presence, and then they would go stand in a semicircle of other gentlemen. At a certain point, Washington would come out, he would greet them individually in this semicircle, share some pleasantries, share some, some words, and then uh, retire back. And after about an hour, uh, men would be expected to leave. It was a very formal, stilted affair, disliked by everybody, by Washington, by the people that went there. And it was this kind of ham-fisted effort to figure out what does a president do? I mean, he's not a monarch, he's an elected person. It's a republic, but yet he's the head of state. He has to have a certain uh, stature. He has to have a certain visibility. Uh, he has to be available to all, but not uh, showing favoritism. And so this kind of formal, uh, levies smacked, particularly to people like Thomas Jefferson, before he was in the cabinet of George Washington, when he heard about these things, he thought they were just ridiculous in an American context because they sounded monarchical. Another thing Washington did weekly uh, was, was Martha Washington created a series of salon teas that she would have on Fridays, sometimes on Thursdays, in which women were invited to come. Uh, and you would have women and men at these, and these were much less formal. Uh, there was much more interaction. In fact, uh, George Washington was often described at these events as, as talking gaily to the ladies and often uh, sharing a joke or a witticism, which seems really out of character. So clearly he was much more at ease in these more informal uh, uh, settings and salons that uh, Martha Washington put together. He also would regularly have dinner parties, so weekly dinner parties, often multiple dinner parties a week. These served, these served fundamental diplomatic functions. Often he would have ambassadors from different countries, often ambassadors from the Native American nations, which were treated formally in diplomacy as if they were foreign nations, um, and oftentimes with different political leaders uh, in the community. And these are really a mixed bag, because depending on what it was, if it was just a dinner party where Washington's trying to get you know, members from different uh, houses in the Senate, from different regions of the country, with some of his cabinet members, uh, he, you know, he often came off as very uh, stilted. He, he didn't, he didn't talk a lot. He's not going to be the guy who is uh, telling you the funny anecdotes. He's not the uh, the life of the party, so to speak. He's quite diffident and shy in general. Uh, he also um, doesn't want to reveal anything. He has an incredible capacity for um, not letting people know what he's thinking. He's a listener by nature, and he uses that to his advantage uh, to think and to have great judgment. But in entertainment circumstances or at a dinner party, it's not exactly the best kind of personality trait you're looking for in your host. And so it was oftentimes uh, heavy lifting to go to one of these, these parties. In fact, uh, some great descriptions of both um, uh, the British ambassador's wife, Henrietta Liston, which is a great journal of hers at the uh, museum or the uh, library in Scotland, 
the National Library of Scotland, but also, or maybe it's at the University of Edinburgh. At any rate, there's a great project right now that Frank Cagliano has been involved at, at Edinburgh to transcribe her diaries of her time in, uh, in the Washington presidency. But the great descriptions of George Washington just being bored to death at these dinner parties and just like banging his spoon absentmindedly on the table or drumming his fingers on the table, you know, in a way that, you know, comes off as a little bit uh, standoffish and frustrating for, for people. So, so his schedule was based around the kind of a social calendar like that, which was intended to do power or to do business. He also did walk regularly uh, in New York, particularly, but also in Philadelphia. He walked outside uh, with, you know, in the general populace. So there you would see the, the president of the United States would just be walking around the city a certain time every day. And he used this to collect his own intelligence on sort of what's going on out in the world, what people are saying out in the world, just sort of as a pleasant uh, gentleman walking around town. But of course, in this case, the president of the United States. Um, so th that's how I think more of like his schedules, daily schedules, you know, as we've talked about in the past, he liked to do his correspondence in the morning. Uh, and then he liked to do some physical activities. Uh, and then he would get down to business. Uh, as well in the afternoon. So things would change throughout the presidency. So Doug, Another question. Scarlett would like to know, in your opinion, what was the most difficult decision Washington faced during his first term? This is a great dissection. In my opinion, what was the most difficult decision George Washington faced? I think it was in the first term. Because the second term is a different ball of wax. So the first term is most difficult decision. I, actually, if you'll allow me, Scarlett, there's two. Policy-wise, the most difficult decision he has to make is that whether deciding whether the bank is constitutional or not, the bank bill, and I'll talk about that in a moment. The other one we've kind of touched already, it was a decision whether or not to stand for a second term, to run for a second term in office. He did not want to do that, and he made that decision at the last possible moment, really in the fall of, um, of uh, 1792, which is, of course, when they're holding the election. He's basically not decided whether he wants to do another term until the last, last moment. I think that's worth its own conversation. The bank bill is really complicated, but essentially uh, it's part of this ongoing fight over uh, Alexander Hamilton's plans to establish the credit of the United States and really get the economy running after what had been years of depression and years of lack of credit in the United States uh, at all. And so let me try to give you the, the short version of this. And if there's other questions, we can dig into it. Now, uh, when the United States fought the American Revolutionary War, they went into great debt. We, we went into tremendous debt to win independence. And this was debt uh, that was held uh, by state governments. So states went into debt and also by the Continental Congress under the guise of the United States of America. Uh, we, we made all sorts of loans to our own people. So in, much, in many cases, these are letters of obligation, IOUs essentially, that were given to, uh, to the soldiers, you know, promising them to be paid in some future moment. This is essentially debt, right? You have to pay those soldiers at some point. And you're promising to do that. It's also obligations that you've gotten with foreign governments. You borrow massive amounts of money uh, from foreign governments, but you don't have any way to pay it back. You have no way to tax if you're the Continental Congress under the Article of uh, the Act, uh, Articles of Confederation. So the U.S. Constitution, one of the main reasons it was created, was to create a mechanism by which the federal government, the United States government, could actually raise money to handle its obligations. Now, Alexander Hamilton, uh, when he comes in as the head of the Treasury Department, his plans to reestablish the public credit of the United States are, are, are layered. There's a sequence of things that he wants to put into place. First, he wants to assume all the debt of all the states of the United States uh, that, that was from the American Revolutionary War. So if the state of Massachusetts has a massive debt uh, which covered what they spent in the American Revolution, that would be assumed by the federal government. The state of Massachusetts debt would go poof, would disappear, and that obligation would now be shared by the whole country. So all the state debts would be gobbled up into one giant new debt that would be refinanced. So you have, you have multiple debts. You've got state debts, you've got uh, uh, U.S. government debts to foreign countries, and then you've got U.S. government obligations to their own citizens. 
Um, and so all of these are going to be going to be bundled together into one massive national debt that's going to be funded by taxpayer dollars uh, in, a, in a regimented way that would eventually, you know, make sure that that debt is uh, is being paid out. This assumption uh, challenge was a big one. Uh, the second big challenge about assumption was that a lot of people didn't want they didn't want that debt to be honored at par, which means if the United States government said, Matt. I owe you $1 for your hard service fighting the British in the war, and I promise to pay you that at some future date. Uh, I will pay you $1. And Matt doesn't get any money because there's no money going around. And in the 1780s, Matt says, you know, forget it. There's this guy I heard of in this other town who's offering to pay me 30 cents on the dollar for my promise. So I'll give him my promise, which I'm never going to see a dollar because I need the money now. And it's not coming. I'll get 30 for 30 cents from this person and they can have my promise, which is probably going to be worthless pretty soon anyway. So those those chits are all out there. Those promises to to pay are all out there. And they've been hoarded up by these uh, speculators. Right. Uh, people, you know, wealth folks who are trying to gamble on the idea that this new government is going to pay these out at par. And that's the policy that Alexander Hamilton recommends. Anytime the United States government promises that it's going to pay the face value of an obligation, it's going to pay 100%. It's not going to devalue it. It's not going to pay 50 cents on the dollar. It's not going to pay 10 cents on the dollar. And that, to a lot of people, James Madison in particular, is seen as immoral because they feel like the soldiers, like Matt, who fought in the war, have basically been screwed out of their money. They've only been paid 30 cents on the dollar, whereas this fat cat, up there in Wall Street is sitting on a pile of this money that they basically bought for pennies on the dollar and they're going to get a huge windfall and it just doesn't seem fair. It's unjust, it's immoral, it's impolitic, uh, it's once again stuffing the cats in Wall Street and screwing the guy, the little man, right? So it's a classic American fight over you know justice in the economy. Um, in this case, Hamilton makes, I think, the, first of all, it's going to be really complicated to figure out who the original bearers of these certificates were and who the buyers were. Secondly, the United States has got to fulfill the obligations they've made. You said you're going to pay a dollar for this sheet of paper. You've got to pay a dollar for it. You cannot discriminate uh, against what, what the different owners are. And this will establish faith in the United States government to fulfill its obligations. So in the future, when we need to borrow money, from an individual or from a European bank or from a rich person, uh, that person or bank or uh, European nation will believe that the United States will pay it back at the full level. So this is controversial. But then the next step of the controversy was that Hamilton wanted to create a national bank to manage all of this debt uh, and to manage the flow of payments and to really help control the money supply. In some ways, as we think of a central bank does today, but in other ways, it was it was somewhat different. Uh, it was a structure that was in place in the in the uh, in the United Kingdom and in, in Great Britain. In fact, when Alexander Hamilton was working on the law to create the national bank, he had the statutes from the Bank of England in front of him, and these were statutes passed at the end of the 17th century in England. So it really is a copy of the Bank of England system, which Hamilton understood really stabilized. Uh, the credit of uh, the United Kingdom allowed them to borrow a lot more than they than they they could if they didn't have a banking system in place, um, and, and it allowed a shared risk. And it was a weird public-private entity because it was there were individual private shareholders of the bank, but the bank was also uh, going to function as uh, as an arm of the treasury uh, in aligning its policies. And so he's really um, he's really creating a financial revolution to go along with. The, con the constitutional revolution that we've seen. And so, uh, but the problem is the US Constitution doesn't say that the Congress has the power to incorporate a corporation. It's nowhere listed in there. It's not one of the enumerated powers under Article One. They're all listed. Congress can do these things. Nowhere in there. But it also has a clause, the necessary and proper clause, which says that all laws that are necessary and proper to achieve these things can also be used. And Hamilton made an aggressive argument that a corporate bank was necessary and proper to achieve the other ends, like dealing with taxes, dealing with public credit, that are allowed in the Constitution. 
And this is so it's an incredible argument. The problem is uh, Jefferson disagreed. Uh, Edmund Randolph disagreed, the, the Attorney General of the United States, and a huge party in Congress disagreed, uh, most notably James Madison. And they were adamant, adamant that George Washington needed to veto that law uh, because Hamilton was threatening to already overturn the Constitution. You're basically creating these, these instruments of government that are going to corrupt the legislature because now people are going to be worried about their pocketbooks when they're crafting policy that affects the national debt, that affects the bank. And so all of a sudden you've allowed Hamilton to become this arch manipulator of, uh, of other uh, politicians, which is how they interpreted what, how the Bank of England worked in Great Britain. And essentially the Lord Treasurer of Great Britain, which by the way, ultimately becomes known as uh, the Prime Minister. It was always the Lord Treasurer first becomes the prime minister of Britain in the 18th century. Hamilton looks like he's maneuvering himself into this role of prime minister where he can distribute uh, the, the gifts of the treasury department to corrupt the legislature. And it's unconstitutional. Uh, and Washington struggled with that decision and ultimately uh, agreed that it was constitutional and was necessary and proper. And so the bank, the first bank of the United States came into effect. But what that caused was it caused a, 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 a real breach with, with Thomas Jefferson in his own cabinet and James Madison, who once they couldn't convince Washington of that, they helped really create an opposition party to the Washington administration uh, as organized as possible because they, they had to start winning votes in Congress. They could no longer depend upon on deals. So that's a long answer to a really good question. What was the hardest? A challenge of Washington in the first term of the presidency, and I think the approval of the bank was it, and the consequences were were legendary, so to speak. They really create the first opposition party. They ultimately create the two-party system, uh, that decision. So the consequences are, are, are incredible. On the other hand, uh, the bank played an important role in really solidifying the financial revolution that made uh, the United States of America a truly free and independent power in the earth that could manage its own finances. There's a lot of governments that never created these kind of banking institutions or funded national debts uh, when they were independent and they just borrowed from foreign governments and ultimately became controlled by those foreign governments. That never happened to the United States of America. And, and a big part of it is because of our financial independence that dates back to the first term of George Washington. Matt. Uh, Doug James would like to know, can you discuss the decision by President Washington to embark on regional tours and uh, what were his goals and priorities? Yeah, so great question. Why did George Washington embark on regional tours? So George Washington, as I said, was a masterful leader who understood his moment and he understood his role. And one thing about the presidency, the office of the presidency, it is the only office, as I said, that represents the nation. But Washington also understands he's not a monarch that the United States is, as he would call it, a government that's dependent upon public opinion. Public opinion is an abstract thing in the 18th century. Uh, when you think of public opinion, we think of opinion polls today. Those didn't really exist. But in fact, public opinion is, is more powerful and more amorphous than that in the American system. It's sort of like the people's voice matters. And, and in fact, in a democratic way, when Washington's thinking about the public opinion, He's thinking about men and women and servants and slaves and, and others. Uh, he's thinking about society more globally. Than, he's not thinking about elect, the electorate, you know. He's thinking about the people. What do the people think? What does society think? What is the attitude of the folks out there? And Washington knows that he's separated himself from, you know, from the people. He's in this office where he's got these formal levies. He's got official duties to take care of. He's doing a million appointments. Uh, and he wants to make his presence felt uh, in, the, in the country for two reasons. One, so he can listen to the people and, and understand what do people generally think about the new government? How is it going? Uh, he needs to get out there amongst them in the countryside. Secondly, he wants to show the national government doing something. Uh, for these these people. The vast majority of Americans in the 1790s wouldn't have seen a government official. Uh, if they did, it would have been a very rare thing. I mean, the post office was one place you might, but other than that, the federal government had a very light touch into the daily lives of people. And there's some exceptions which come to some of the excise taxes that later get passed. But that's for the second term 
everybody's second term. So anyway, the first term, the first trip Washington makes, and it's after that first extraordinary session of Congress. So that first session that passes all these laws ends in September. George Washington immediately decamps and goes to New England. And he visits all the uh, uh, all the, the important towns in New England, visits with governors, uh, goes into these towns, and again, it's a, it's like a, a, a procession. He's got certain members on his team, his staff uh, with him. Uh, he's got uh, you know some enslaved people with him, servants with him, uh, and 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 he enters each of these towns. He travels by carriage, but he often would get out of his carriage and get onto his big white horse, Prescott. This beautiful white charger that he rode in the presidency. And he would get on that horse before he rode into town because that's how people expected him to appear. Washington was an incredible actor of the presidency. In fact, that's a direct quote from uh, John Adams who called Washington the greatest actor of the presidency in a Shakespearean sense, he says. He also references Garrick, uh, the great uh, English actor of the London stage in the 18th century, but you guys wouldn't know who that is. Think Sir Anthony Hopkins. He's the greatest English actor, right? So Washington uh, was the great actor of the presidency. It's about performance. Leadership is about performance and persuasion as much as anything. And here he is embodying the new national government arriving into town. So for instance, when he goes to Boston, there's 18,000 people in the town. Boston only has a population of about 15,000, 16,000 at that time. And so there's people coming in from all over the place of all walks of life. It's the whole society. Uh, and it's a parade, you know, that greets him. There's a reviewing stand he has to stand on. There's all the different, uh, you know, trade unions and merchants groups and religious groups and, uh, and, and important individuals and women and children uh, walk, you know, parade in front of him. Uh, it, it's a remarkable series of banquets and balls and toasts and cannonades uh, and the sharing of, uh, you know, the sharing of intelligence, the sharing of information. And he's very careful not to show too much a favor for any particular politician, but also assert his authority and independence from the governors. So the governor of Massachusetts, when he arrives in Boston is John Hancock, who we all know has a giant signature and he has a giant ego to go with that signature. Hancock, in fact, thought he should have been the first commander in chief of the American army way back in the day, which would have been a disaster uh, for the history of the United States. Anyway, so Hancock, you know, as governor of Massachusetts, invites George Washington to come to him uh, at the governor's mansion for dinner, uh, invites him to stay with him. George Washington refuses to do that uh, and finds ways to not accept gracefully and really forces uh, Hancock to come visit Washington. And Hancock pretends he's suffering from the gout or something like that and has to be kind of carried into the room. Oh, this is the reason I didn't rush over to see you immediately, your uh, president, your excellency, Mr. President. Uh, because I had this bad leg. So it's, you know, a lot of these sort of personal politics at play, again, with presidents and governors sort of trying to establish their own authority in their own way. It's a new system. Washington is a big part of that. Uh, the Southern tour is similar. It's the next year Washington goes on a tour. Uh, actually, it's in 1791. Uh, he goes on a tour of the South, uh, which is remarkable. He had never been south of Virginia ever in his life, uh, south of the of the, the southern border of the state of Virginia. And so he, you know, he makes a remarkable tour all the way down into Georgia. There's a great book by uh, Warren uh, Bingham, who's uh, a wonderful friend of Mount Vernon. You should take a look at the Southern Tour book. Fascinating. You could still follow a lot of those landmarks today of trees that he sat under and rocks that he was by and inns that he stayed at. And really that, that march through the South, really interested in their agriculture and whether they supported the government and what they were concerned about. And that's what was so effective of Washington's tour. There wouldn't be another president until James Monroe, who visited every state of the Union uh, during their presidency. And Monroe was emulating Washington when he did it. Uh, the Union was much bigger then. It's certainly harder to get out West. Uh, but Washington visited every state. Now, I'll make one other final point on this, which is a really important one. Um, is that Washington, when he went on his New England tour, he didn't go to Rhode Island. He skipped it because Rhode Island had not yet ratified the Constitution. So he wasn't president of Rhode Island. Rhode Island was still basically an independent, sovereign nation, if you can believe that. It reminds me of the old line from the, of the South Carolinian who opposed uh, 
uh, who, who opposed the session, Matt, where he said uh, South Carolina is too small for a nation and too large for an insane asylum. Uh, and that's why they shouldn't have seceded. But similarly to Rhode Island, and everybody thought Rhode Island was crazy uh, back then, but ultimately when they did come into the Union, Washington visited them uh, before the capital moved to Philadelphia. And that trip to Rhode Island is one of the most important because of the, uh, the interaction he had with the Jewish community in Rhode Island, in which he, he famously wrote a letter protecting not only their uh, privilege to, to worship in their own way, but actually that it was their natural right in this new system and that the United States gave to bigotry no sanction and to persecution no assistance. Uh, protecting a minority religion before the First Amendment has been ratified as the President of the United States, showing uh, that the President's bully pulpit goes back to the original President of the United States, that the values of who we are, aspirational values, what does it mean to be American, come out of the mouths of Presidents and it's very important and has been important. Uh, that letter to the Turo Synagogue, which you can see on our webpage or at the great webpage of the Turo Synagogue in Rhode Island, tells a story of religious freedom in this country that dates to the founding itself. And it's really one of the most important uh, parts of Washington's tours. Uh, great question, Matt. Doug Joy would like to know, uh, did George Washington have a role model or someone he looked to for advice? Did George Washington have a role model or someone he looked to for advice? So George Washington was not afraid to take advice. Uh, interestingly, uh, you know, the cabinet provides all kinds of advice. Now we talked about his role models in life, you know, in earlier conversations that we've had together in his youth. He had the Fairfax, William Fairfax and Thomas Fairfax. Uh, he had his brother. You know, you know, he, he has uh, different mentors. He has George Mason during the coming of the American Revolution. He works very closely with James Madison in this early phase, setting up the presidency and takes a lot of advice from him, but also from others. Uh, John Jay, who's the uh, first uh, justice of the Supreme Court is giving him advice in an informal way. And Jay's interesting because he's very clear to separate his function as the, the, the chief justice of the Supreme Court from his ability to give sort of informal advice uh, to George Washington, the man, and the president, and because uh, he didn't want this to be seen you know, in that light of him, him having an official role to serve the whims of the executive branch, uh, interestingly. So Washington looks for advice in all, all places, you know, and, and a, lot of the, a lot of the challenging things he's doing as he's setting up the government is appointing people to all these new government posts. I mean, there's thousands of new posts that are being created, particularly once the Treasury Department starts creating the customs laws with the customs revenue officers, and there's military officers that have to be appointed, and there's all kinds of other functionaries, and the president has the appointment power, and he doesn't know everybody, obviously, in the country, and so he has to listen to advice to hear, well, who should I appoint to be the commissioner of customs in the port of uh, Newport, uh, or in the port of Savannah, Georgia? He's gotta listen to the politicians in Georgia, the friends that he trusts, you know, and, and so he does a lot of listening. Now, fortunately, one of the great aspects of Washington's leadership, as many of his contemporaries commented on, was his extraordinary judgment. And judgment for Washington meant listening for all the advice, weighing all the options, then making a decision carefully, prudently. Uh, and that's how Washington approached uh, working with advice. Now, the other great story about advice with Washington is, of course, the Constitution has in it a section which tells the president that he needs to take the advice and consent of the Senate for the ratification of treaties. And so uh, early on in George Washington's presidency, the first treaty that is ratified in 1790 in New York is a treaty with the Creek Confederacy. Now, one of George Washington's major challenges is dealing with Native American um, diplomacy in the early Republic. Native Americans are still a dominant power west of the Allegheny Mountains in many areas but also in large stretches of what we call the kind of interior, what is now the Southeast of the United States, states that hadn't been uh, developed at that time. The Creek Confederacy is a, is a very large Native American um, collection of different language groups, different tribes, different um, uh, economies, uh, led in this loose way, uh, but uh, by particularly a guy named Alexander McGilvery, who, who was uh, uh, one of the representative chiefs of uh, the Creek Confederacy. In fact, there was at least 20 or so who came to New York to negotiate this treaty. And Washington knew he needed to keep uh, 
the Creek Confederacy and the people of Georgia uh, at peace. But they didn't have the resources to fight there. Uh, at the time Washington became president, there was only 600 soldiers in the US Army. Uh, there was nowhere in the United States that could produce gunpowder on any scale. There was nowhere that you had to trust the ability to make guns at any scale. The United States was, was a Lilliputian government. It was a tiny nation. Uh, despite having vast geographic ambitions and being surrounded by hostile uh, enemies in many cases. So Washington was always looking for diplomatic solutions to challenges that sometimes um, might, have, might have led to war. So this first treaty with the Creek Confederacy is a very generous treaty to the leadership of the Creek, particularly Alexander McGill, where he gets a secret part of the treaty. He's made a brigadier general. The American army gets a salary for life that sort of thing. At any rate, Washington brings the treaty to the Senate for advice and consent to follow the constitutional guidelines on the ratification of treaties. Uh, and the treaty is read, and John Adams is the presiding officer of the Senate, right, as the president pro tem of the Senate, as the vice president is, asks the members, do they advise and consent to the treaty? And nobody knew what to do. And the senators asked for a delay they wanted to create a committee, right? You go to Congress to get something done and they create a committee. Uh, in this case, the senators were probably right. Well, we, if we're gonna give advice, we need to really dig our teeth into this and talk about it. That, of course, was completely against what Washington wanted to happen. He already had a perfectly acceptable treaty ready to go. And he, he left in a huff and said, this, you know, this is an insult to the very reason why I'm here, or, or this is a waste of my time. Uh, he does come back, um, but basically he is quoted as saying, it might be apocryphal, and for the little kids out there, cover your ears, uh, he, he is uh, quoted as saying, I'll be damned if I ever come back here again. And in fact, no president of the United States has ever gone to the Senate for advice and consent. Uh, the Senate has become a place that ratifies treaties by voting them, uh, not by being involved in the negotiating process. Establishing an important precedent, not only in how the Constitution would actually function, different from how it's written, right? How it would actually function in governance, um, but also really establishing the first plank in the primacy of the, Fed, of the presidency, of the executive branch in setting foreign policy, uh, which, you know, from hindsight makes very much sense, but isn't in the Constitution itself. The Senate has a very big role to play. Whereas George Washington now has established the idea that he's going to negotiate treaties, the Senate will approve them for them to become law, but the, but the executive branch is in charge of diplomacy. So, a question from so that's one of the big precedents to remember. So a question from Adam. Uh, can you speak a bit about the cabinet selection? I thought I read that Hamilton and Jefferson were actually second choices. What was his selection process like? So great question about Washington's selection of the cabinet. Um, and the question was about Jefferson and, and Hamilton and whether they were first choices. Uh, great question. George Washington, as the first president, uh, you know, the, the Constitution talks about executive officers, um, and these are created in that first session of Congress. You create the Department of uh, State, which was originally called the Department of Foreign Affairs. The Department of State was different because it was intended to be both foreign and internal affairs. And also um, the Department of War, Treasury, pardon me. Uh, and so uh, Washington, you know, in trying to fill these roles for Treasury, he tries to get his old pal Richard Morris to do it. He had been the financier of the American Revolution, probably one of the most important founders you've never heard of. And if you haven't heard about him, you should study him a little bit. He is the one who really helped figure out how to finance uh, the American government during the American Revolutionary War itself, to the extent to which we could manage it internally without help from foreign powers. Uh, he asked him to be the Secretary of the Treasury, and he asked him who he should ask, and, and Morris recommended uh, Hamilton. Uh, and Washington, of course, had known Hamilton as a wonderful aide-de-camp of the American Revolution, a man of great valor, uh, a man of frenetic energy, um, and also knew that he could handle it. And so um, Hamilton is given that role, ultimately. Uh, he also asked to be the first Secretary of State, John Jay. John Jay, who would go on to become the first justice of the Supreme Court, had been uh, really one of the last operating officers of the Articles of Confederation. He had been the, uh, 
the head of the Department of Foreign Affairs under the Articles of Confederation. So he was very much involved. You remember that Jay had been one of the people that had negotiated the Treaty of Paris with Benjamin Franklin and uh, John Adams. And so Jay is known in Europe. He's a brilliant uh, legal mind. He had been, you know, he'd written the Constitution of the state of New York. Uh, he's an incredible figure. And he, he asked if Washington gives him really his pick of jobs, thinking state was best for him, but he chooses to be the Chief Justice of the United States. He ultimately leaves the Chief Justice role because he feels like it's an impotent um, role. And that's a conversation for another day, the Supreme Court, and it's in the early days. But he goes after that to become governor of the state of New York, actually, where there was a lot of power. Uh, so John Jay uh, is not chosen, uh, and Thomas Jefferson ultimately uh, takes the role. At the time, he's still an American representative in Paris, uh, and he returns back home to realize Washington has appointed him to be Secretary of State, which Jefferson doesn't really want. He wants to go back to Monticello. He's been in France for years at this point. He loves his native Virginia. He loves his land. He wants to get back to it. Um, but Washington uh, you know, points him to this role and notes that none of us want to do this, but we have to. I need you here. And Jefferson ultimately becomes the first Secretary of State. Questions? So Doug, probably just time for three more questions. Oh, three more questions. There's a lot of good ones here, so we'll, we'll follow up with answers on all of them. Okay, um, three great questions coming. Uh, what wasn't a George, Lori would like to know, wasn't George Washington going to retire at the end of his first term? Yes, George, Lori again, George Washington, wasn't he gonna retire at the end of his first term? Yes, in fact, he wanted to retire after two years. Uh, and he, he asked James Madison to write him a farewell address in the summer of, of 1792. So that presidential election is gonna happen in the fall of 1792 with his next inauguration, you know, it's gonna be in uh, 1793 in March. Back then they were in March. So let's put our heads around that. So he's inaugurated in April of 1789. Four years later would be March of 1793. So in 1792 is when the decisions have to be made. And it's pretty clear to me um, now, I, I, don't, uh, I don't know if everyone would agree with me about this, but I will argue with any scholar out there. I think that Washington originally thought Thomas Jefferson would be his choice to be the next president of the United States. And that starts to fall apart really in 1791 a little bit, but in 1792 in particular with the bank bill. Uh, it's clear at this point that, that Jefferson is in opposition and he can't get along with Hamilton, but, but Washington is still trying. There's a series of meetings in which he pleads with Jefferson to work with Hamilton. Hamilton agrees that, okay, maybe we can let bygones be bygones and work together. Uh, Jefferson basically refuses, essentially, uh, believes that Washington doesn't understand what a dangerous man Hamilton really is, that he doesn't get it. Uh, and <clears throat> and this, ser this series of efforts to keep Jefferson and Hamilton working together is a, is a failure and Washington, it, it, Washington is convinced by both of them. They tell him, you have to stand for a next term. If you don't become president, the country will fall apart. Jefferson specifically says, um, if you're not president, the, the, the union will sever. It will split along northern and southern lines or western and eastern lines. Um, but essentially, he doesn't see any way the union will hold together in that time of great controversy over uh, uh, the funding bills uh, and uh, the bank bill. Hamilton similarly believes that Washington's the only man to hold it together. The final person that's influential, however, is Elizabeth Willing Powell. Now, Elizabeth Powell is a very influential figure in Washington's circle uh, in the uh, in the years of the presidency. She is um, uh, she's an extraordinary figure. She's married to the mayor of Philadelphia, Samuel Powell, who was a businessman. Uh, who is uh, one, of the, uh, one of the friends of George and Martha Washington, and they've known each other for years. In fact, Washington stayed with the Powells during the Constitutional Convention. Uh, he had the finest house in Philadelphia. In fact, uh, rented it out to George Washington, uh, the Powell House, I believe, uh, when he, when, when he became, uh, became the executive mansion, although I may be thinking of Governor Morris's house. Anyway, you can Google it. Uh, well, don't Google it. Go on Mount Vernon's webpage and look at it. But anyway, so Elizabeth Powell writes a letter to George Washington in which she tells him, and this is in the fall of 1792, it is probably the final letter that convinces him, 
She says that the country will fall apart if you're not president. You need to get over yourself, George, essentially, and stop pretending like you're not important because you are. And it's really great that you always say how humble you are and you know how you don't want power and you don't want to do this, but we need you. We need you to step up and do this and, and do it. And George Washington does. He stays uh, and stands for office again. Again, he's elected unanimously uh, in the um, in the Electoral College. But of course, it's a really close fight for that second place role, uh, and it's between Thomas Jefferson and and John Adams. And Adams is again selected to be the vice president because again, it's still the second most votes. They don't run as a group. Uh, and Adams barely squeaks in, which of course infuriates him, and also speaks to the polarization that's right below the surface of George Washington. You now have a polarized situation of politics between two parties, which I'll talk about next time I talk about the presidency, uh, because they really bleed into the story of the French Revolution, uh, which, is, which is really a drama that rolls uh, fully into uh, full form right at the beginning of George Washington's second administration. Matt. So Doug, Cynthia would like to know, uh, how much did George Washington consult Martha on presidential decisions? How much did George Washington consult Martha? We have no idea. I mean, this is the problem. Martha destroyed their correspondence or George Washington directed her to destroy it while he was still alive. It doesn't exist. We don't know. Secondly, there isn't a lot of correspondence between men and women who are living in the same house. Uh, a great example of this is, uh, is, Ale is Abigail Adams and John Adams. And of course, they have a tremendous love affair that we can see in their correspondence over a lifetime. But uh, you know that, in some ways, through the Revolutionary period, they're very rarely together. Adams is in Europe; uh, he's down in Philadelphia. She's up in Braintree, Massachusetts. Their correspondence is the way that we can see them communicating together. They're only together for like seven years between 1775 and you know, 1790 something. I mean, it's remarkable. So their story is rich because this correspondence exists of when they were apart. When they're together in the White House as in their presidency, they have, we have huge gaps. We don't know what they're saying to each other because they're not writing messages back and forth. They're having conversations. So to what extent did George Washington have a conversation with Martha? He could have had one every day, you know, in the presidency about it. He could have complained to her every morning over his old biscuits. I have no idea. Or he could have never brought it up with her. Now, clearly, Elizabeth Powell, you know, had the confidence to share her thoughts. So Washington had shared his ideas and his aspirations. And we know that Martha loathed being first lady. She's the first first lady. She's also the first first lady to describe it as being like a bird in a cage. Uh, very many first ladies have felt trapped in this role in which they have to be perfect and public, but not political, the representative of all women, but also, you know, the great helpmeet of the great man. It's an infuriating, challenging role to play. And Martha, as sociable as she was, and, and, and uh, you know, and, and a great hostess that she was, she was not bred to be this uh, person. Uh, it was a new thing for her. She also was walking on untrodden ground. So uh, they probably both complained together about their roles, and um, but but ultimately, and I do see that a sign of this, you know, towards the end of her life, she would always say, you know, if it's in the good of the nation, then George Washington has always done it, and therefore I will do it as well. So if it serves a public good, we will grin and bear it, stiff upper lip, we will get it done. So Martha likely, you know, uh, was part of the decision making process, but um, but we just don't have. Great question. And Doug, just time for one more question from Jacob. Uh, Lincoln is famous for being uh, very accessible to Americans. In what ways did George Washington listen to requests, qualms, and needs of constituents? Well, a really good question, kind of comparing Lincoln's leadership style in the office and Washington's. In some ways, uh, they're, they're similar in their awareness of the importance of public perception of themselves in their role. Now, Washington leads in an 18th century manner that fits his personality. He, he leads by, um, you know, by playing this role of the great man, the great general, the father of the country, trying to stand above the fray, trying to represent strength and stability in a time of incredible insecurity. Will this tiny country actually survive in this tempestuous politics and then ultimately world war that he has to deal with? Lincoln has a different personality. He's similarly a showman. I think they're both great actors. Uh, in fact, they both love the theater. We know Lincoln, of course, was 
shot in the theater. But if you look at his diary, he's in the theater all the time. And George Washington is similarly going to the theater regularly. They both love the theater. They understand the performance of power. But Lincoln, uh, lead, he leads through humor uh, in a way that George Washington doesn't. He uses funny anecdotes and parables to uh, conciliate, to, to calm tempers down, to make points that are both oblique but sometimes quite forceful. Um, and it's just part of his personality. He's a storyteller. Uh, and, you know, I think that uh, any great biography of Lincoln really points that out. Is, and that speaks to his willingness also to be available to uh, the American people, the regular folk. We also have to remember that, um, you know, it's, in George Washington's time, he was quite available as well, although there were hierarchies in society that would shape who would be willing to go talk with him. It wasn't as democratic as it would be in the 19th century, culturally, in a sense. But, you know, if you visited the presidential mansion in Philadelphia, in the 1790s, there's no guards outside. There's no armed guards. There's no gate. Uh, basically, the front door is right off the street. You can go up and knock on the door. I mean, it's completely different from the world we live in today. The sense of distance from these people. As democratic as we are, I can't go knock on the White House door right now. I mean, my God, particularly with the social distancing. But, you know, in, in the normal times. So think about that difference. So it's a really different age. And, and then if you think about Lincoln's time, it's a democratic world where, uh, you know, where particularly all men, I mean, feel like they have a right to talk to anybody. I mean, and that's sort of the charm and the, the, the character of 19th century democracy. It's loud and rambunctious, and Lincoln fits that. He's, he has an ability to kind of work within that world really effectively. So it's a, it's a great question, you know, and, and I think you think about uh, leadership uh, as I come to a conclusion here. I'm going to give a talk next week. Uh, to the Army War College, the full core of the Army War College, in which I'm going to look at uh, George Washington as a strategic leader. What they teach at, at the, sorry, it's not the Army War College, it's the National War College. What they teach at the National War College is strategic leadership. It's for all the great operational commanders uh, who get selected for this program that are going to go on into strategic leaders in our country. I've been giving this talk for five years to that, the core of this group, the students change, uh, every year, and they've been asking me to come back and talk about George Washington as a strategic leader. And I'll be focusing a lot on his presidency. So uh, unlike this ramble, it'll be a more organized talk in which we lay out kind of the ways he functioned as a leader in that environment. But the thing I think to remember about all these people, you know, whether it's uh, your pastor or your mother or, you know, your, uh, your neighbor or your community leader, your governor, your senator, your, your president, uh, business leaders, the leadership comes in all shapes and sizes. You don't have to look like George Washington or talk like George Washington or have the same talents he had to be a great leader. Uh, you do need to have that flexibility to understand that there's a lot of different ways to do things. Conciliate, firmness, prudence, good judgment, listening, uh, you know, presenting yourself to the people, uh, communicating. I mean, they, these are the things that made George Washington a great leader, and they're sort of universal. And they don't have to do with the fact that he looked great on horseback. He knew he looked great on horseback, and he used that. But if you don't look great on horseback, don't ride into the office on a horse. You know. At any rate, more to come on leadership next week and the presidency. Thank you for tuning in uh, today. Thank you for supporting Mount Vernon. Go ahead and subscribe to our uh, social media channels. Like these videos. Share them around. Uh, I'm happy to say that uh, they, they're getting some play out there, and Mount Vernon is doing its best to help educate and share our mission uh, at this extraordinary time. Thank you.